You know, I think the HIV field went from hope to promise decades ago uh, with lots of optimism. And I, I think that you might sense that that's where we are. We, we are moving from hope to promise and we're very excited and we're very optimistic about uh, uh, what we're doing. So let me, because we're in New York, let me tell you a New York's uh, story that will kind of transfer you to, to my world. And it's, it's a story about a 100-year-old gentleman that walks into a life insurance company and wants life, life insurance. And the clerk says, we don't give life insurance to 100 years old. And he said, why? My mother is insured here. She's 120. And they said, she's fine? He said, yeah, she's fine. So the clerk thinks better. They go to the boss. And they both come to the gentleman and say, you know what, we'd love to give you life insurance. In fact, why don't you come Tuesday and we'll have all the papers ready. And the gentleman says, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm busy on Tuesday. And they say, you know, old man, what do you have on Tuesday? He says, on Tuesday, it happens that my grandfather is getting married. <laughs> Said, your grandfather is getting married? How old is your grandfather? 150. And he wants to get married? He said, he doesn't want to, but his parents puts lots of pressure on <laughs> So uh, with this attitude, and, and it's answering your question a little bit. Uh, you know, Woody Allen, another New Yorker uh, that I quote a lot, he, he says, I'm, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> And I think Jamie demonstrated that what we are afraid is not really of the dying, it's being sick for a long time in the rest of our, our life, forgetting one disease and the treatment and then another disease and the treatment and the third disease and the treatment as we demonstrated uh, all of us. And we think that, and, and then you have three diseases with three treatments and interaction and life becomes really with poor quality. and and. Jamie used the, the slide to show something, but let me make some uh, other points around the same slide. Okay, the slide that depicts what happened to death from diseases as we age. First of all, notice that this is a log scan, a, a log scale, okay? So cardiovascular disease goes from five to 5,000. It's a thousand fold risk. And you might think cholesterol is a risk, but cholesterol is a three fold risk. Okay, aging is really a major risk factor, the major risk factor. And you see that the cancer is basically, you know, it's, it's like the same, it's almost the same line. It shows you how the mechanisms are shared here. And it's also a thousand-fold uh, risk. And the point for us, looking at the slide like that, is that unless you stop aging, all you can hope for is to exchange one disease for another, okay? And the success that we had in cardiovascular and now in cancer really drove more of the Alzheimer's to appear. But if we can stop the aging, then it'll have a, a major impact. Uh, and and, and, and I, I hope that you understand what, what Jamie basically was saying is we're agnostic to which disease we're going to target. You know, maybe somebody comes with a cardiovascular disease and will prevent his uh, dementia. It doesn't matter what they're coming from because the risk factor for all those diseases is the same. Now, what do you get first, okay, may determine on your genetics and environment. If you have a mother with type 2 diabetes and you're obese, you'll get diabetes first. But no matter what, if you're biologically aging fast, you'll get the next disease also, because everybody's accumulating those diseases. Um, and I don't want to expand more about, about, uh, about what, what George showed before. And by the way, thank you for the, those two great lectures, and I'll, I'll just make some other points. You, you heard everything you need to know, by the way. I'm just, I'm just relaxed now and making other uh, points and showing you something interesting. Um, so there is the biology, but we've done something really interesting in the field. Uh, instead of just looking at you know, the, the descriptive biology of aging, we started looking at models who have longevity. 
And by looking at those models, we actually were pointed to some of the pathways that are important for aging. To say that we know everything, we don't, but we really, really learned a lot. And I would tell you that healthy lifespan, and it's very important to understand the healthy part of lifespan. We don't want to extend lifespan like the ITP if there's no health span associated with that. But healthy lifespan has been extended in variety of models from yeast to flies to uh, nematodes and mice and rats and, and, and primates. And we've done it by genetic way, by interaction with the environment and by drugs. And we already mentioned those, those uh, two drugs and the importance with those drugs, actually all the drugs that you've seen, they're in human use. So we have to kind of think of how to repurpose uh, that and then we, we take away from the FDA the hostility of coming with a commercial company that they don't know what uh, that they're <coughs> suspicious with. And this is a, sl a version of a, a, a slide that you, you, sh you saw in principle, and this is the mTOR pathway that is targeted by rapamycin, but what it shows you is a dose response. And rapamycin, in high dose, extends life by 24%. So the best way to extend life is by rapamycin, but I actually put here it here to say rapamycin needs more development. It's not really safe, okay? It's, it's now prescribed to people after organ transplant or to certain tumors, but it has side effects, the major of which is diabetes, which I don't think the HIV people are really the ones to enjoy it most. By the way, the animals at the ITP that live the longest are those who were treated with rapamycin and metformin. Okay, those are the longest living uh, animals. So, considering the fact that, the, the, that we moved from looking at progeria, you know, of, of diseases that are associated with rapid aging or just with aging, we really moved to longevity. And at that time, I decided also to look at really why 100 years old are, are doing so well. And this is another New York family, the Khans, and I have permission to talk on their behalf. And they were four siblings that were born between 1910 and 1920 uh, to two parents in New York City, Upper East Side. And they, the interesting thing about the, this family is that all of them reached the, the age of 102. They, they were shocked when their little sister here died at 102. They couldn't believe that. And the rest went on living to 110, 107, and 109. And it was interesting to understand, you know, first of all, what are the chances? And second, what is there in their psychological uh, state, in their medical history, in uh, their habits? What is it that allowed them to live uh, so long. And I've, I've got many of those subjects and I, we've obtained all, all the data. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you uh, some, of those, uh, some of those stories. But basically, we have a, a rare population. When we started, only one of 10,000 got to be age 100. And we have 600 and actually 70 centenarians now. In two studies, one is called Longevity Gene Project, where we take centenarians and their children, and the other is called Longenity, which is an ongoing study, longitudinal study, where we're taking offspring of centenarians and age match control, and we're following them as they age to see the effect of the genotypes that we're finding on their longevity. So those are the two studies, and we, uh, and, and we are taking only Ashkenazi Jews, and, and the reason is, is purely genetic. It's always better for genetic study to work with homogeneous population. The best population in the world are the Icelandics, because they, are all, they all have a, a five Viking fathers and four Irish women, okay? So they're, they're like brothers, cousins. So, they have the same genome, basically, and if some, some of them have diabetes, you can identify the genes of diabetes better. There are half a million people only. Uh, so we need a bigger population in order to get enough uh, centenarians, and so we're looking at Ashkenazi <coughs> Jews. 
And we found that there is a remarkable family history of exceptional longevity. It really runs in the family. If you want to be uh, healthy, you have to choose your parents uh, right. And we had two hypotheses. One hypothesis is, you know, it's one out of 10,000, so maybe they have just the best genome, okay? They don't get all those SNPs and mutations that others are getting, and that's why they get there. And the other hypothesis is maybe they have protective genes that help them get to where, where they are. But before I'll show you which hypothesis is right, I just want to make sure that you understand that people with exceptional longevity, it's not that they get disease when everybody gets disease and they hang out for 20, 30 years. In fact, when you look at two studies, those are the control, it's females here, those are the control in two studies and those are the centenarians. Their health span, okay, those are diseases we included, their health span was increased by 20, 30 years, okay? In fact, there are more centenarians that stayed healthy than, uh, than control at age 80. So they live long and they live healthier. But that's only part of the story. The, are, the other part of the story that they have contraction of morbidity. In other words, at the end of life, they are sick for a very short time. A lot of them are not sick at all. They just don't wake up in the morning. Uh, and this contraction of morbidity actually was assessed in the CDC since 1993. 1993 was the first data that showed that the medical health cost in the last two years of life of somebody who lived to be over age 100 is third of those who died at age 70. So we see contraction of morbidity and the economy shows contraction of morbidity. And by the way, because of data like that and others, a, a trial like TAME that we expect will extend health span, maybe by two years, or if we can do it by two years, will have a $7 trillion effect on the economy by the year 2050. So to be healthy is really a great economical, uh, uh, economical plan based on the data that we have. The second thing is you might say, but you know, maybe those guys did what the doctor ask them, uh, ask us to do. Maybe then they were, you know, non-obese, exercising, uh, doing all the right things. And th these are the results. Overweight or obese, almost half of them. Uh, smoking, 60% of the men and 30% and of the women. Helen, the old sister that got to age 110, she celebrated 90 years of two packs of cigarette smoking. And when, when so, so, by the way, so it, I can promise you if you smoke for 90 years, you're going to live long life, right? <laughs> when I asked her, so nobody told you to stop smoking? And she said, well, all four doctors that told me to stop smoking, they all died. <laughs> <laughs> um, alcohol daily, not enough. Physical activity, and I'm talking about walking, bicycling, housework, you know, less than half of them. If there are vegetarians here, only 2.6% are vegetarians. And we compare them to Enhance One, that is kind of their cohort, and they're either similar or, or worse than this cohort. So as a population, there's nothing special with what they have done. In fact, they often claim something that they're doing as the reason that they get there, like eating chicken fat or something like that. Because they actually can do whatever they want to do, it doesn't matter to them. Okay, so now more to the science. So the first question was, do they have the perfect genome? And the first thing that we did, once we have the whole genome sequencing of the first 44 centenarians, and we didn't have the control or anybody else, we went to this uh, database that's called CleanVar. Now they have almost 20,000 variants that are considered pathogenic. In other words, if you have this variant, you're most probably going to get this disease. This is how CleanVar wor works. So we said, you know, maybe they have zero, you know, that maybe they have not, none of that. Okay, and the answer is, not only they don't have uh, not only they have a lot of it, I mean, 
44 centenarians have 230 something mutations that should have given them a disease. And nobody had any one of those diseases. And if you're asking what diseases will Parkinson's, uh, APOE, we have two gentlemen that are APOE4, that uh, they are 100 years old. The textbook says APOE4, you're demented at 70 and dead at 80. And they're not demented, they're dead in, in, in 100. Degenerative disease, neoplastic, cardiac, other dominant, other recessive. And also when you do just the genotyping with, with the technology we use, you know, the million SNPs, there's, they have just as many of those SNPs for diseases as others. So they get to this age in, in spite of that, okay? They must have other way that protects them and delay their aging, and it's not because they have a perfect <coughs> genome. And we've discovered some of those, and I'll make just reference to, to some. So what, what we're looking, we have the age axis. We have people between 50 and 112 is our oldest one. And we're looking for trends for genotypes or mutations whose rates are increasing at 100 uh, compared to those that are uh, in their 50s and 60s. And uh, I, I want to point that those two things, one is APOC3, which is a, a lipid gene. Um, we have, a, uh, we have people who have a SNP in the promoter of this APOC3 and have very <coughs> favorable lipid profile. Um, and also people with CTP uh, mutation, a functional mu mutation, exomic mutation in the CTP that, have, uh, that is also associated with high HDL and good protective uh, phenotype. And those were two basically longevity genes in the sense that they are doubled at 100 years old. And the, really the point I want to make is that based on those data, there are two companies that have developed drugs. Okay, now those companies are not interested in aging. They actually are interested in cardiovascular disease. But uh, human genetics provides some safety abilities for the companies to understand what happens with people that, that have natural occurring things like that, and, and what's the, you know, what diseases they're having. Regeneron, uh, which is a, a New York company here, that's what they're doing. They're not, they not asking scientists what, what to develop based on the, the mice studies or cell study. They are looking for human experiment and developing drugs like that and get them to mice later and not first. So, so, so by the way, one of them, uh, just last week in New England Journal, or two weeks ago, this is the CTP inhib inhibitor of Merck that um, in a clinical uh, trial delayed uh, atherosclerosis uh, vascular disease significant, significantly. So some of what we're finding actually gets, gets back and find itself to uh, develop as a treatment. But I want to tell you another uh, story and that's the growth hormone and IGF-1 pathway. Um, and I, I think it might re be relevant to HIV. So this is the story. Small dogs live longer. Ponies live longer than thoroughbreds. Uh, when you mutate the uh, insulin IGF-1 uh, pathway nematodes, they live longer. When you do those experiments in rodents, those that have high growth hormone and are big are dying young. Those that are, are dwarf, they're, they're, they have a longevity, and uh, there are other specific models like that. So it seems that in nature, in, in every species, if you just de diminish the growth hormone IGF, you get good effects on longevity. In humans, certainly, there's a lot of evidence that if, um, if you have high IGF-1 level, it's a risk, right? This is one. It's a risk for, for cancers. Uh, but there, as far as mortality, it's kind of mixed. Oops, sorry. It's kind of mixed. Uh, cancer mortality is increased, but cardiovascular mor uh, uh, mortality seems to decrease and all causes of mortality are all over. And I actually thought, you know, it's wonderful to write a grant there, but I'll disprove that growth hormone IGF in humans has anything to do with longevity. 
And then Yushin Su, who's a geneticist that uh, collaborates with me, I recruited to Einstein and, and we're working on those projects together. She actually sequenced a lot of the growth hormone IGF pathway, but then in the IGF receptor, she, uh, she, got, she found two new mutations that haven't been found before. Those were uh, known ones. And, and, those muta and we found nine mutations like that. So we have subgroup of centenarians that have uh, mutations, and they were non-synonymous, um, they, and, and they were shorter, and it all kind of fitted together. But in my mind, I said, okay, so 2% of our population have this mutation, but they probably have something else that allows them to, to live uh, longer because maybe they're just protected from cancer. And then we went on several weeks in June. We had this paper where we found people with the deletion of exome 3 of growth hormone, rece of growth hormone receptors. And we noticed that in our population, there's, there, it goes from 3% to 12% of our population. In other words, it behaves like a longevity gene. And uh, Gilad Smon, my uh, collaborator, uh, got samples from other uh, studies, the Amish, the French Caucasian, the CHS study. And in each study, he validated that people who live uh, longer have increased uh, prevalence of those, of those mutations. Uh, in all those studies, people with those mutations live longer than people without these mutations. And there is something really interesting about it because to our surprise, those guys were significantly one inch taller than others. So they have they, it seems that they have a problem with growth hormone receptor. They live longer, but they are taller. How does that happen? And in short, the biology is interesting because when you don't have enough growth hormone, they produce less IGF, and their IGF-1 level is lower. But when you stimulate them with growth hormone, okay, so it's true for proliferation and activation. But when you give them a lot of growth hormone, they're actually hyperactive. So what happens during puberty, when they have growth hormone, they actually are taller. But throughout life, they have lower IGF-1 levels. Uh, also, Sophia uh, Milman, who's running our uh, centenarian studies, have showed that in females who have the lowest level of IGF, they basically live twice, they have uh, double the survival. Okay, so those are centenarians, okay? When you look at centenarians, who's going to die and who's not, those with the low IGF, they survive longer. But interestingly, it's gender specific. And this is something that in aging we have missed in many levels. And, and we shouldn't have because women are living two, three years longer than, than men. And what is the mechanism? This is huge. <laughs> what is the mechanism of that? And now we are discovering the gender, the sex differences. Also in the ITP, like George showed, some of them are, are sex specific. They work just in male or females. But, 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 uh, but, but you understand that the, the data has been accumulating, and I'm not showing you everything, but over 50% of our centenarians have some disturbance in the growth hormone IGF axis. So I think it's really very important for for, for human. I'll also show you that those women with a low IGF-1 level have half of the cognitive dysfunction of the, the females that have normal or high IGF-1 level. And again, it's, it's sex specific. The, the males actually seems to have better cognition with lower IGF, not, st not significantly, but, um, but the, it, it, there's a gender issue. Um, and it remains even when we adjust it for, you know, for lots of things that you have to adjust. And also, as far as muscle function, you see most of the PVALs are not significant. Whether you have low IGF or not, you're not paying, at least, for less muscle function. The ability of low IGF to give you resiliency for aging probably over or, or is equal for the fact that you don't have IGF that is a growth factor for muscle. So uh, you, you don't pay for that. 
Okay, but what can we do about it? So we found, you know, I showed you the example of Merck and uh, developing a drug, but what we can, can we do with, the, with this? So we got in touch with uh, Amgen, who were developing those IGF receptor antibodies for treatment of cancer, for pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer have huge amount of, uh, of those receptors, and several companies have developed it, and they basically have failed, okay? But they developed the drug. So they modernized the drug, and we did a preliminary study where we, we saw that that uh, females, uh, who, were, who we gave the drug, by the way, the drug is injection once a week, uh, that, that females, uh, fe uh, female uh, mice uh, seem to live longer, so we started a, a whole study that is now in a review where we introduce the treatment in old age, okay? A, a lot of the things we're doing are introducing in old age to see, you know, to see that it's never too late. So we introduced it like age 70 equivalent, and we showed an almost 15% increase in lifespan of females with this an, uh, antibody to the IGF receptor that is already in, in a human trial. So uh, there's optimism. We can, we can develop drug and we can target mechanisms that seems to be uh, important. Jamie showed you how we moved to humans, and I just want to make, a, a, to repeat a point that you, you made really good, really well. Uh, TAME will be a proof of concept that will show that multiple morbidities of ages can be targeting by metformin. But for me, the reason that I'm leading this trial is not because of that, because in my mind, metformin will work. It's more that we need to have an indication for, that is similar to aging. Because there are better drugs, a combination of drugs, other pathways that can be targeted, and we just need the tools so we can really interfere with aging at any age, at any time. I'll skip that. So uh, the summary is that genomic studies in centenarians suggest uh, several mechanisms for uh, exceptional longevity. <coughs> Um, uh, they, they will increase treatment with, with those mechanisms increase the protective resiliency and they protect, which, which George discussed, and, and protection from age-related disease. The growth hormone IGF pathway seems relevant to human uh, longevity. Uh, other strategies we mentioned, TAME, IGF receptor antibodies, and basically we can have a discussion, but a lot of what I said is true to uh, managing HIV. I'll just tell you, HIV, and, and I see lots of patients because I have a diabetes clinic, uh, I'm attending diabetes clinic when I'm in town on Thursday mornings, and we have lots of, in the Bronx, and I have lots of HIV uh, patients, and they are aging uh, rapidly. There, there's no doubt for me as a clinician on that. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's no doubt for you. Another disease that, um, an, another condition that is associated with aging is actually uh, cancer therapy. People, people after cancer, cancer therapy, whether it's chemotherapy or radiation, no surprise to us, increase the rate of aging. So to tackle aging is important, not for the old, elderly, but for many other people. And also, if we really want to land in March, then, uh, on Mars, then uh, two and a half years on the road is accelerated aging with the radiation and everything. So we need to tackle aging for that too. So we need to tackle aging at any, uh, uh, at any uh, time, uh, fast as possible, and it's absolutely relevant to you. Thank you so much. <laughs>